She was born amongst the greatest battleships created. Built for destruction to go head to head against enemy giants in ocean duels. But she would carve her own path instead using 16 inch guns that crushed enemies with impunity. But would her massive guns and magnificent crews be enough to save her from time itself? She battled an advanced enemy to assist in winning the Second World War. She went on to help stop aggression in Korea, Vietnam, and the Middle East. The Old Grey Lady would go on to become the most decorated battleship in history. She is the battleship New Jersey. Surrounded by all this navy blue and gold, I had a strange feeling that I'm back on the set filming Hellcats of the Navy. December 28, 1982, Long Beach, California. President Ronald Reagan officially recommissions the World War II battleship USS New Jersey. I hereby place the United States ship New Jersey in commission. God bless and Godspeed. 40 years after she had been built and long after her original foes in the Japanese Imperial Navy had vanished, she was reborn for a third time. From when you're a kid growing up, you see all the John Wayne movies. I say, hey, you know, I want to be on a ship like that. When he brought her back out, that's when I decided to re-enlist and go on board her. In a time of nuclear-powered armadas, the New Jersey is called upon to project American power. Reagan wanted to outbuild the Russian military. And so in order to do that, we had to take the ships we had. Critics argue long-range missiles and planes render the New Jersey obsolete. But she is about to put her critics to rest. Lebanon is in the midst of a bloody civil conflict. The government of Lebanon has requested, and I have approved, the deployment of United States forces to Beirut as part of a multinational force. On October 23, 1983, suicide bombers blow up the Marine Corps barracks, killing 241, including Michael Gorchensky, a member of the New Jersey's crew who had gone ashore to help the Marines with their radars. But lacking any targets at which to strike back, the crew on the New Jersey feels helpless. It was very frustrating. I think it was frustrating for everybody. The chance to strike back arrives when U.S. planes flying a mission over a Syrian-controlled region of Lebanon come under fire. Two are shot down. One pilot dies. Lieutenant Robert Goodman is captured. This time, the New Jersey's guns roar to life. All guns, one round low. Sitting just offshore, her guns pound target 16 to 18 miles beyond Beirut. There's no, no mistake about it. It's a very dangerous weapon. Four decades after her launch, and for the first time since the Vietnam War, the New Jersey once again proves her critics wrong by establishing her place in modern warfare. It's a role she seems destined to repeat even before she fired her first shot. One year after entering the war, United States... At 2.16 p.m. on December 7, 1942, one year after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, 20,000 people gather at the Philadelphia Navy Yard to watch the U.S. Navy launch its newest member of the fleet, the battleship USS New Jersey. The launching of a battleship was a spectacular event. It was a, a subject for newsreels, newspapers, radio, what have you. This was a big event. Her first commanding officer is Captain Carl F. Holden. His maiden crew consists of roughly 2,400 sailors, 
many of them getting their first shipboard experience. As the Big J steams south towards the Panama Canal and ultimately the Pacific Ocean, she is but the latest in a long line of battleships. For almost a hundred years, these dreadnoughts roamed the high seas by outgunning enemy vessels. But before this master of the sea ever confronts German U-boats on the open waters or barely escapes Japanese torpedoes, she must contend with an even greater threat, one that will haunt her to the end. Technology. In the years following the First World War, the airplane began to surpass the battleship as the supreme weapon. Planes flew much further than the guns could shoot. Armed with bombs or torpedoes, pilots could damage or sink even the largest ships. Aircraft carriers are now the masters of the sea. Nevertheless, the U.S. Navy remains confident that New Jersey will make a difference. She features 16-inch guns on rotating turrets, 17-inch thick armor plating, and the speed to outrun many smaller ships. The New Jersey is hailed as a super battleship, one of the four massive Iowa-class ships. The Jersey, along with the Missouri, Wisconsin, and Iowa, are designed for speed and power. Their job will be to kill the powerful German and Japanese dreadnoughts. The Iowa-class battleships were the supreme development of the battleship type in the U.S. Navy. New Jersey, 887 feet long, 58,000 tons displacement, 212,000 shaft horsepower, 33 knots. When New Jersey was uh, brought into service in 1943, she had all the state-of-the-art technologies of the day. It's interesting when you take a look around, you see uh, the, the old mixed with the new state-of-the-art of the 1980s. This is a good example. Here we have the port side decoy launcher. It would fire chaff or strips of aluminum to create a false radar echo. What's also interesting is right here next to it, that's your good old-fashioned voice pipe. The Jersey comes armed with 25-inch guns, along with a hornet's nest of more than 100 anti-aircraft guns. But her greatest power comes from her most striking physical feature, three massive rotating turrets. Each stands almost seven stories deep and weighs approximately 1,700 tons. Protruding from each turret are three 16-inch Mark VII guns. It was like sending a Volkswagen 23 miles in 45 seconds. The smallest shell was 1,900 pounds, and the largest shell was 2,700 pounds, and they would go 23 miles, roughly 1,800 miles an hour. Like uh, many of the equipment on board the uh, New Jersey, it's still active and works. And we also have the four shafts for the ship's four propellers. Should we have our rudder indicator, regular telephone systems, bitch boxes as they were called, which were backup systems. But what also sets the New Jersey apart from enemy battleships is her radar-controlled fire systems. The ability to use the radar to accurately place the shells was much superior to anything the Japanese or even the Germans had. But will all of this be enough? Can the Jersey, still untested in battle, hold their own with the new superstars of battle, carriers and planes? Will her 16-inch guns defeat both the enemy and her critics? The Jersey's first test comes when the USS New Jersey joins Fast Carrier Task Force 58 for an assault upon the Marshall Islands. But her first battle will be less than glamorous. Commander Rear Admiral Mark Mitcher places the New Jersey in a defensive position guarding against incoming aircraft. But only her anti-aircraft batteries will fire. The 16-inchers remain silent. U.S. troops begin their invasion of the Marshall Islands, but due to limited Japanese air defense, the New Jersey continues to see little action. That all changes for her at Truk.
Operation Hailstone is underway against the Japanese air and naval base located in the Carolina Islands. The Imperial Navy uses truck as a major supply depot for its garrisons scattered across the Central and South Pacific. But rather than fight against the more powerful Americans, the Japanese sails the bulk of its fleet away from the area. As the surface task group moves into position, the Jersey's crew is called to general quarters, battle stations. From over the horizon, torpedo planes approach. Yeah, you're scared, yeah. But you're looking at a plane here. Now, you don't know what's in the back of you come around the other side. And he could be coming in with a torpedo and hit you. Just hope the gunners on the other side of the ship is as good as the ones on the port side or starboard. The Jersey's 40 and 20 millimeter gunners blanket the sky, forcing the torpedo planes to break off their attack. But Japanese ships are racing towards her. Crew members spot a Japanese minesweeping trawler, the Shonan Maru. This time, the Jersey's five-inch gunners get some action, firing hundreds of rounds into its overmatched opponent. The Big J records its first kill as the Shonan Maru explodes in a huge fireball. Then another ship appears at close range, the Japanese destroyer Mayakaze. Again, the five-inch gun crews blast away. This time, the enemy fires back but misses. Two other American vessels join in the attack and send the Mayakazi down, her guns firing away until her deck is awash. Joining the battle is the Japanese light cruiser Katori. Turning towards the New Jersey, she fires a spread of torpedoes. Still reeling from earlier attacks, the New Jersey braces as the spread of torpedoes races toward them. The Jersey's guns sit helpless. Her crew can only watch and pray. The battleship USS New Jersey is thick in the middle of her first fight. Operation Hailstone has pitted ship against ship. But the action has distracted the Jersey from the Japanese cruiser Katori, which unleashes a spread of torpedoes towards her. Up on the bridge, the crew reacts slowly, not realizing the torpedoes are aimed at them. When they finally do understand the danger they and their ship are in, they have no time to react. The first torpedo narrowly misses the Jersey's aft hull, the other passing through her wake. Luck, which becomes a hallmark of the USS New Jersey, saves the moment. But the near disaster serves as a stark reminder of the battleship's vulnerability. In the months after truck, the American Navy continues its way towards Japan. Orders are sent to the Imperial First Mobile Fleet to attack and annihilate the American Task Force 58, now sitting in the Philippine Sea. Hundreds of Japanese planes fill the sky. The USS New Jersey, with her battery of anti-aircraft guns, takes its battle station in a protective screen around the carriers. American Hellcat fighter pilots fly off to engage their Japanese counterparts. We were watching planes coming in and left and right because our own planes are dogfighting. The gunners are shooting these 20 millimeters through a crosshair. 
Now that's just like taking a shotgun and looking through the front of the barrel. You don't know who's who. And then they just come over to speaker, cease firing. We're shooting at our own planes. The Jersey's gunners must wait until the Japanese planes fly lower for their attack to make a positive ID. At this critical moment, they open fire, downing one enemy plane and damaging several others. While the New Jersey remains in a screening position, F-6F Hellcats from the American carriers outgun and outfly their opponents. The battle turns into a rout. The Japanese lose more than 350 planes to U.S. fighter pilots in what becomes known as the Marianas Turkey Shoot. In August of 1944, after just one year in active service, the New Jersey is bestowed a prestigious honor. Admiral William F. Halsey, Jr., commander of the U.S. Third Fleet, breaks his flag and selects her as his flagship. On October 23, 1944, American forces prepare to make good on General Douglas MacArthur's famous pledge to return and liberate the country. The Imperial Japanese Navy mounts a three-pronged naval effort aimed at attacking the Americans' amphibious landing. Some came up from the south through Surigawa Strait. A central force under Admiral Takeo Kurita was coming through the San Bernardino Strait. That's where Admiral Lee, Admiral Mitcher, wanted to keep some battleships to put a cork in the bottle. Facing off are nearly 300 ships, 1,800 planes, and 200,000 men. Admiral Halsey and the crew on the New Jersey await the long-anticipated gun battle that is expected to pit the Japanese dreadnoughts and the American Iowa-class warships in a face-to-face -face slugout. The sailors anxiously hope they will prove themselves. Many compose their last will and testament. From that area right up there, Admiral Halsey led Third Fleet in the largest naval battle in world history. A bridge, like uh, on a warship or a merchant ship, any ship at sea is a very important and special place. It was from here that uh, the ship was conned or steered while at sea. The captain spent most of his time here on the bridge. All important decisions would have been done right here from this very bridge. As the battle begins, the New Jersey is primed and ready for real ship-to-ship -ship conflict. But Admiral Halsey makes a fateful decision. Several Japanese carriers have positioned themselves as a decoy to lure Task Force 38 away from the San Bernardino Strait. Halsey takes the bait. It's a controversial decision, one that sends his most powerful ships, including the New Jersey, on a wild goose chase, leaving the troop ships and men fighting on the island under the protection of a small contingent of American escort carriers, destroyers, and destroyer escorts. As Halsey sails north, the Japanese battleships move through San Bernardino Strait and attack. But in a fierce battle, the American tin cans hold on. The Japanese, unsure of what they are fighting, decide to turn back. When the fight is over, the Americans have lost six ships and 3,500 men. Admiral Halsey's decision leaves the New Jersey deprived of fulfilling the role for which he was built. The idea was that our biggest battleships would fight against Japan's biggest battleships. And that duel never came about. In the winter of 1944-45, Admiral Halsey transfers his flagship, and the New Jersey returns to her support role. In February, she takes part in support of the first airstrikes on the Japanese home island since the Doolittle Raid of 1942. 
On March 19th, anti-aircraft gunners helped shoot down more than a half dozen planes. Three days later, her 16-inch guns bombard Japanese positions on Okinawa. In early August 1945, the Jersey returns to the Western Pacific. She is included in the plan to attack the Japanese mainland. We are now prepared to destroy more rapidly and completely every productive enterprise the Japanese have in any city. But on August 6, 1945, the Japanese city of Hiroshima is destroyed as the first atomic bomb falls from the B-29 bomber Enola Gay. Three days later, another falls on Nagasaki. I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration, which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. On August 14th, word arrives the Japanese Imperial Command has agreed to the Allied terms of surrender. The Jersey's crew is subdued. They still don't trust the Japanese. The New Jersey had served with distinction, both in combat and as a flagship. Given this record, the crew expects formal surrender ceremonies will take place on the decks of their ship. The debate, however, would soon become a moot point. We were supposed to be heading towards Tokyo Bay, but we detoured down to the Philippines, and we got a message that we were to stay in Subic Bay, that the signing was going to be on the Missouri. Congress thought that would make the president feel good because he was from Missouri, so, and his daughter had christened that ship. We were all hurt there, yeah. You can't beat politics. <laughs> the war in the Pacific is over. And for those who strategize what future wars will require, so too is the age of the battleship. This is now the atomic age. With the prospect of powerful missiles and long-range planes capable of delivering a striking blow far beyond the range of the New Jersey's 16-inch guns. She had won 11 battle stars without suffering a single casualty. She had played a critical role in providing anti-aircraft protection and in support of amphibious landings. She had helped win the Second World War. But now, at just over five years of age, the New Jersey is considered an antique. Military thinkers and government bean counters soon do what the critics and the Japanese could not, silence her guns. On June 30th, 1948, sitting in her home port of Bayonne, New Jersey, the once mighty battleship has her guns capped and sealed with cosmoline oil. Her colors hauled down, she is put into mothballs. The New Jersey is formally decommissioned from the Navy's active roster. I said, well, I'll never see you again, honey, and thank you, I walked away. When they went into mothballs, I thought, okay, they're going to cut them up for scrap, you know, like they did with a lot of other ships, you know. But the New Jersey will rise again. Her 16-inch guns will prove more valuable in the nuclear age than in the war for which she was built. At the start of the 1950s, the horrors of the Second World War are fading. But a new conflict begins to simmer. When North Korea invades the South in June 1950, the U.S. Navy has only one battleship in its active fleet, the USS Missouri. Needing massive firepower quickly, the Navy brass orders the New Jersey out of mothballs and back into action. Every piece of equipment is checked, cleaned, and tested. Her 16-inch guns are unsealed. Crews working round the clock get her seaworthy in just four months.
On November 21, 1950, the Navy recommissions the USS New Jersey back into service. A new crew comes aboard, commanded by Captain David M. Tyree. This time, military commanders welcome her back with open arms. In Korea, the Jersey begins firing 1,900-pound shells of high explosives at communist troops, bridges, rail lines, and artillery positions. They could launch those projectiles against uh, targets in the Korean Peninsula. And unlike an airplane that can be shot down, there's no way of stopping the projectile once it, it was fired. Moving up and down the coastline, the Jersey pounds enemy targets and supports Allied ground troops. The ship, saved from the graveyard, is now saving lives. The forward observer of the Marine Corps said, this is the greatest bombardment accuracy I've ever witnessed. He said, you guys are absolutely unbelievable. He said, you saved us today. When they would get ready to fire the big 16-inch guns of the main battery, they would actually have to go around and crank down all of these windows. So if they didn't, the concussion from the 16-inch rifles would actually shatter the windows. Here in the center of the navigation bridge on the battleship New Jersey is the armored citadel. It's uh, essentially a, a large, thick armored can that's upside down. And inside here on the O4 level was uh, essentially where they would con the ship in uh, times of battle. And approximately six to eight people would be crammed inside a space that was no larger than a medium-sized walk-in closet. On May 21st, 1951 at 9.30 a.m., several of the crew on deck notice splashes in the water and that they are getting closer. A shore-based North Korean artillery crew has the New Jersey in range. Enemy rounds knock out the periscope. Others ricochet off the turret's heavy armor. All hell broke loose. The shells were coming in. Myself and another guy heard it, and we dove uh, behind the 40 quad that was on the main deck for cover. We got up, the minute we got up, we saw two guys that were wounded on the main deck. Bob Osterwine, who I had met a few days before from Detroit, Michigan, was hit very badly. You knew he was gone. Seaman apprentice Robert Osterwind's shipmates want vengeance, and they have the weapons to exact immediate retribution. Gun plotters locate the enemy position in the mouth of a cave. The Jersey's guns fire back. The three turrets of the big 16s came point blank, and that kept up for, I don't know, 15, 20, 40 minutes. All I remember was my arms were damn tired. There wasn't anything living over there. The New Jersey sails the water off Korea for two tours, adding even more citations and awards. But one record that was lost was that of a ship with no casualties. The crew would honor the loss of one of their own, the only USS New Jersey sailor killed in action, Robert Osterwind. So at Panmunjom on 27 July 1953, the Korean conflict ends. When a ceasefire is established on July 27, 1953, the New Jersey leaves Korea and joins the Atlantic fleet. But the ship is expensive to maintain. Her second life comes to an end. On August 21, 1957, the New Jersey is officially decommissioned for the second time. She is once again discarded into the mothball fleet. But as this Jersey girl has proven many times before, you can't keep a good woman down. History will soon require her to dust off and serve once more. 
the New Jersey is about to rise again. In April of 1968, the Vietnam War is more than three years old. In the sky, Air Force and Navy pilots are increasingly shot down on bombing runs over North Vietnam. To protect its ground troops and to save pilots' lives, the Defense Department decides to bring in some big guns. The decision is not without controversy. The Chief of Naval Operations believes air power alone can do the job in Vietnam. But the chairman of the Armed Services Committee argues that a battleship's long range means it can hit many of the targets an airplane can bomb. Projectiles can't be shot down and become prisoners of war. It's been over a decade since the New Jersey went into mothballs. But because she is in better condition than her sister ships, she is selected. On April 6, 1968, the USS New Jersey is commissioned for the third time. Captain J. Edward Snyder is the Jersey's new commander. The 25-year-old ship seems almost an anachronism with its towering superstructure and huge guns. War is much different now than when she last fired her guns. And so the Jersey comes outfitted with a new electronic anti-missile radar and helicopter pad. Reborn into an era of nuclear-powered carriers and submarines, the USS New Jersey is now the only active battleship in the world. The New Jersey shatters the silence of the ancient forest north of the Ben Ha River as her massive guns launch 1,900-pound shells towards an enemy supply depot. Five minutes, we could put 90 tons of ordnance on a target. Just the 16-inch guns. There was one case in February 1969 that they fired all night. The paint had burned and blistered off the gun barrels because they had gotten so hot. They made a complete circle around the American encampment because the North Vietnamese were all surrounding them. And the New Jersey's guns saved their lives that night. But those same guns were a constant danger for the crew of the New Jersey as well. I was working on the lower shell deck of turret number three and we were busy moving projectiles around, getting them in the right positions. When one of them got stuck in the projectile hoist that we were using, I had to cut the rope to free it. And at that point, another piece of machinery was turned on. Uh, the center ring of the turret drugged my foot. By the time the machinery was stopped by one of, one of the fellows I was working with, it had me around the waist. And increasingly, this thing was moving and pulling me into the hoist more and more. They said that Andrew had gotten trapped in there, and we only have minutes and seconds to get him out. Yeah, I, I just felt my leg snap and crush, and I could feel the bones breaking. I thought I was going to die right there at the spot. I didn't think there was any way they were going to get me out of there before I was crushed to death. There was a chain that, that bind some of the shells, and the shells were 1,900 pounds apiece. But I broke that chain, and I reached up, and I grabbed that doggone projectile that was stuck. He literally picked this solid mass up, pulled it up off of me, and threw it down onto the deck. It was his superhero feat that actually freed me, and I think if he hadn't done what he did at the time, I probably would have eventually died right there at the spot. When they, they were getting ready to medevac him, and he left the ship there, then that was it. That's the last time I saw Andy. I hadn't seen him no more. The USS New Jersey completes her first Vietnam tour and returns home in April 1969. But in a stunning announcement, word arrives in August from the Pentagon. The New Jersey is to be decommissioned, put into mothballs for a third time. The crew is in a state of shock. There was a sense of both anger and sadness 
because we were primed and ready to go over and, and save more American lives. Captain Robert Penniston, with a sense of the New Jersey's proud battle record, value, and history, offers these prescient words. Rest well, yet sleep lightly, and hear the call, if again sounded, to provide firepower for freedom. That call will be sounded once more, this time in the cauldron of the Middle East. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear that I will face... In January 1981, president Ronald Reagan is sworn in as the 40th president of the United States. He brings to Washington a promise to rebuild America's depleted military. Reagan's Secretary of the Navy, John Lehman, recalls the USS New Jersey for the third time. She looked uncared for, you know, inside and out. The veteran of three wars will require her greatest revamping to date. She receives a high-tech overhaul including eight Tomahawk missile launchers, 16 Harpoon missiles, and improved radar systems. With $326 million in retrofitting, USS New Jersey has regained her place among the mightiest ships in the world. All the way aft on the navigation bridge of New Jersey is the chart house, and that's where we are right now. Hundreds of uh, charts were kept on board for her operational area. In addition to the charts that they would use, they also had access to Omega and Loran navigational fixes. Uh, later on in the 80s and 90s, they started to use satellites from space to be able to pinpoint where they were on the surface of the Earth within a foot. So in order for the captain to be able to do his job, they would keep all of these systems as close together as possible. The chart house, the conning tower, the navigation bridge so that he was only a couple of footsteps away from stepping on the bridge at any point in time. And this was critical in order to keep the ship, crew, and other ships at sea as safe as possible as New Jersey maneuvered around on the world's oceans. In September of 1983, the USS New Jersey arrives off the coast of Lebanon in the Middle East. Bloody conflict threatens to tear the nation apart. The United States went into Lebanon as a peacekeeping force and then wound up in a combatant role. A month after the New Jersey's arrival, horrible news reaches the crew. A suicide bomber has destroyed the four-story Marine Corps barracks in Beirut. 241 Americans are dead. The feeling is you want to get even. Your hands are tied. Who do you go after? You know, you don't know who to shoot at. That's the feeling. Two months later, in December, Syrian anti-aircraft gunners begin shooting at U.S. planes, downing two. This time, the New Jersey retaliates. Then again, in February 1984, the New Jersey opens up on the Syrian-controlled Bekaa Valley. She fired so many that she completely destroyed the Syrian gun batteries. We fired 288 rounds into the Bekaa Valley. I was responsible for some over 100 of those. You think sometimes, you know, that there were people on the receiving end of that. Faceless, you know, you don't know. Sometimes you, you, you wake up thinking about the, the people that, that died because of you. It's tough. On February 26th, the New Jersey fires 13 rounds into Syrian anti-aircraft positions. It would be the last time an enemy would hear the thunder of her 16-inch guns. On April 2nd, President Reagan orders the Marines and the New Jersey out of Lebanon. 
the administration has decided to abandon the area. The peacekeeping mission has failed to keep the peace. Over the next several years, the USS New Jersey is assigned a variety of exercises and operations with the Pacific Fleet. American taxpayers, not concerned with defense but with the cost of bread, demand a peace dividend. So once more, the Navy retires the New Jersey along with her crew of about 1,500 sailors. She is decommissioned for a fourth and final time on February 8, 1991 in Long Beach, California. The retiring of the USS Missouri a year later would bring to a close the nearly 100-year era of the battleship. You, you think of her as a person, as a being that has a soul. You feel that, that there's a heart there as if this were, in fact, a, a human being that you had a relationship with. The door was closed by powers above, and, and that was the end for her. But true to her good fortune, she would finally escape the fate of so many of her contemporaries who saw their end in a scrapyard. The big story on Action News is America's most decorated battleship back in port in South Philadelphia on this Veterans Day, 1999. She embarks on one final voyage to Camden, New Jersey, where she is polished, cleaned, and restored. In October of 2001, the New Jersey opens as a grand museum showcasing her historic career. Many who served aboard her work tirelessly to make this happen and to ensure no one forgets this grand old lady is America's most decorated battleship. The New Jersey was a symbol of our country. It's a tangible reminder of an era that's now past. The ship has a soul, but really, of course, it's the men that serve on her. Andy, how long has it been uh, since you and Wayne have seen each other? Uh, it's been 37 years since the day of the, uh, the accident, in, uh, January 14th, 1969. And it's been a long time. I can't, can't wait to say, I mean, you know, I can't wait to thank him personally for what he did for me. Yeah, I've often thought about whatever become of him, you know. Did he make it? Did he, did he lose his leg? Uh, you know. What kind of life did he live after that, you know? He came in from the other side. And I'd just like to just see him, just to fellowship with him one more time. I think that's just more than an honor or privilege, you know, I told you. I often thought about how I was going to react when and if I ever saw Wayne again. I can honestly tell you, I really don't know when we meet. We'll, we'll figure out the words to say. It's gotta be him. Coming down there. Uh -huh. Wayne Johnson. Yeah. Lord help us. It's been too many years. <laughs> How you doing, man? How are you, sir? How you doing, fellas? It's been too many years. <laughs> How you doing? All right. Lord help us. I thought I'd never seen this life. What's going on, man? All right, all right. Oh. Wayne. Oh. Oh, Lord, I've had some ups and downs. Thank you, sir. God bless you. I, I had to see you in person to thank oh, you for thank saving you. my life. Lord, thank you. It's just been a pleasure. 37 Lord. years. It's been a long, long time. The battleship may no longer be the fearsome master of the high seas, but for five decades, one plied the waters of the world and proved her worth over and over again. In World War II, her anti-aircraft weapons blasted skies filled with Japanese planes. In the Korean and Vietnam Wars, her 16-inch guns pounded enemy positions with impunity. Hers is the great story of freedom that filled the hearts of the over 50,000 men who served aboard her through four wars. Hers was the determination the dedication and willingness to serve again and again. She is the Battleship New Jersey, one of the last great battleships.